Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the FAA and Industry Safe Air Charter Workshop. I'm Tim Allen, your MC. I'm an Operations Aviation Safety Inspector with CIT, the Special Emphasis Investigations Team in Fort Worth, Texas. Before we start, I'd like to provide you with a few housekeeping rules. First off, we're not here to solicit consensus advice or recommendations from anyone or to assign any tasks to the group, but we're really interested in taking your questions. To do that, we'll be posting the Google form link on the live stream. Feel free to submit a question there at any time. Throughout the webinar, we'll select some questions you have submitted via the Google form, which I will discuss with our panel. Our FAA team is monitoring the live stream, so if you have any problems at any time during the meeting, give us a shout and we'll assist you. Oh, and for any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. Now I'd like to introduce to you Larry Fields. Larry is the FAA's Deputy Executive Director of Flight Standards. Larry oversees the development, coordination, and execution of regulations, policies, standards, systems, and procedures. He coordinates and executes program plans that govern the operations, maintenance, and airworthiness of all U.S. aircraft, including those of U.S. flag carriers, foreign carriers when not operating in and over the United States, its territories and possessions. His oversight responsibilities also include proficiency and certification of air agencies, flight schools, maintenance bases, and of qualified airmen, and other than air traffic control personnel. One note of importance, Larry is responsible for all 78 flight standards districts offices and 21 certificate management offices. So if the buck stops anywhere, it stops with Larry. Good afternoon, Larry. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you for taking some time from your busy day to join us for a frank discussion on what has become a persistent safety issue, illegal charters. It's a problem that in all likelihood could get worse given the global health crisis and the pressures on the aviation community. But with the help of a well-informed industry and public and the vast majority of charter operators who do follow the rules, we can do our part in reducing the threat. After my initial remarks, we will moderate a government and industry panel to discuss the latest information we have on illegal charters and what we're doing about this activity. Over the next 90 minutes, our panel will have discussions and take your questions. We're really interested in what you have to say. So please use the Google form link on the live stream and submit questions at any time during the webinar. This is an issue that affects operators and manufacturers alike, but more importantly, the traveling public. That has come to view air travel as virtually risk-free. They trust that the basic safety precautions airlines must follow will apply across the board to anyone operating an FAA registered aircraft. Unfortunately, that trust can be abused by either willful misconduct of opportunists pretending to be legitimate air carriers or others who are misinterpreting the rules. When someone books a flight from a legitimate FAA approved air carrier, there is a huge and largely unseen safety infrastructure supporting that purchase, reducing the risk and greatly increasing the probability of an incident-free flight from point A to point B. There are required pilot training and testing regimens, safety and operational control requirements, maintenance rules, flight management, and insurance requirements, to name a few. Almost 15 years ago, three passengers who took a chartered round trip flight out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, found out the hard way that those rules don't apply for illegal charters. On the return leg at approximately 10 p.m., the pilot impacted terrain after an unsuccessful instrument approach in low clouds to Drake Field. All three passengers survived despite serious injuries, but the pilot was killed. Three years later, the FAA proposed a $4 million civil penalty for Spitfire Aviation Services for operating illegal charters, which included nearly 800 passenger flights over two years with three aircraft, including the accident aircraft. It was highly unlikely that customers knew Spitfire did not have an FAA-approved pilot training program 
maintenance program, and other required infrastructure. As is often the case, we at the FAA became aware of the issue from a competitor on the airfield. As for insurance claims, the survivors had no recourse. The pilot was killed and Spitfire went out of business. With illegal charters, passengers are denied not only their financial benefits, but every safeguard the FAA works so hard to protect. There are more recent cases I wish I could discuss, but they remain in litigation. Typically at the FAA, we have many illegal charter investigations underway at any given time. What concerns me right now is that with COVID-19 fueling a downturn in the economy, people could get creative about how to keep their aircraft and pilots flying. We've seen this in the economic downturns in the 1980s, 1990s, and in the 2007-2008 timeframe. The conditions are more than right for the same thing to happen right now. So that's a big reason we're meeting today. There are three groups we're messaging today, legitimate charter operators, illegal charter operators, and the traveling public. For legitimate charter operators, first, I'll say this. Thank you for doing this the right way and in doing so, protecting your customers and the reputation of our air transportation system. Second, please keep in mind what our government partners in the Homeland Security sector like to say. If you see something, say something. We can't be present at every airport where charter activity might be taking place. So we need you to be our eyes and ears. As you already know, stopping this illegal activity is beneficial for both of us. For any illegal charter operators out there, or those of you who may be contemplating such an activity, and sometimes it can start off innocently enough, I am here to tell you that you have an opportunity to reach out to the FAA Flight Standards District offices and come into compliance. We'll work with you. But in the meantime, you have to stop conducting any type of activity that may be contrary to the regulations. And for the traveling public, before you take another flight with a charter operator, ask them one simple question. May I see your air carrier certificate? If they have an office, it should be on the wall. If they cannot produce it, don't fly with them. And please let the FAA know about the incident. One easy way is to go to the FAA's website, website, FAA.gov, and click on Safe Air Charter button at the bottom of the page. Or go to the website, avoidillegalcharter.com which is hosted by our industry partner in this effort, the National Air Transportation Association. The website also makes it very easy to look up an operator or aircraft to determine its air carrier certificate status. I'll repeat what I said earlier. We need everyone's help in recognizing, flagging, and eliminating this activity whenever and wherever we find it or suspect it. Your safety and the safety of your family or your business could be at stake, as well as the reputation of our aviation system as a whole. So thanks again for participating in our webinar, and now I'll turn it back over to Tim Allen. Thank you, Larry. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the FAA Industry and Safe Air Charter Workshop. As a reminder, we're not here to solicit consensus advice or recommendations from anyone or to assign any task to the group but we are interested in taking your questions. Oh, and for any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. Today's meeting is all about the impacts of the air charter industry and what we can do to help each other to ensure safety. Now I'd like to introduce our panel members. Slide four, please. Representing the FAA is Don Riley, Aviation Safety Inspector, Flight Standards CIT, Special Emphasis Investigation Team. David Volker is also an FAA Safety Inspector, see it. Greg Lander, Senior Attorney and FAA General Counsel. And our industry partners joining us today are Ryan Wagspack, Senior Vice President, National Air Transportation Association, and Kent Jackson, Managing Partner with JetLaw. 
I'd like to thank all the participants on the panel for taking the time and effort to join us today. Your presence here shows your commitment and passion to work together to identify, report, and shut down illegal air charter operators. Remember, no matter how they're disguised, illegal air charters are a threat to safety. Now I want to welcome all of our viewers on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. We look forward to a lively discussion and getting your questions. Any questions that can't be answered here or we run out of time, we'll post the follow-up information on the FAA Safe Air Charter website. Next slide, please. Let's take a look at our agenda. Key concepts we'll be discussing, illegal operations and operational control. It's important to understand these terms. Then we'll learn industry and FAA perspectives on how we got here and why. We'll be representing an FAA and industry perspective. We'll get into the nuts and bolts, basic regulatory concepts and requirements that you should know. It's important to know which FAA operational rules apply, part 91 or part 135. Then it's on to appropriate versus inappropriate reimbursements and holding out and exactly what constitutes an illegal charter. Next, we'll discuss what's being done to address illegal charters. Then we'll wrap up with giving you resources and red flags to look for and where to get more information. The next slide, we'll talk about what do we mean by illegal operations. Operations conducted under part 91 that should be flown under part 135 by an air carrier or part 91K by an authorized fractional program manager. Examples of this include improper flight sharing, such as flight now, wet leases disguised as dry leases, individual leases, for example, owners wet leasing to offset cost of ownership or help a friend, Blackbird and similar systems to hold out to the public, improper dry lease pools, essentially fractional programs without the additional protections required by Part 91K, and 135 operators conducting unauthorized flights, such as aircraft not on their certificate or flights outside their authorized air operations area. Slide seven. The next topic for discussion is operational control. A key element the FAA has observed in suspect operations is a failure to understand the concept of operational control or for it to be ignored. Lessees tend to sign documents stating that they have operational control, but it's likely that that control remains with the lessor. Let's get started. On the next slide, we'd like to ask our industry partners to share their perspective on how we got here. I'll turn it over to Ryan Wagspack and Kent Jackson, then we'll hear the FAA perspective from Don Riley and Dave Volker. Let's begin with Ryan Wagspack. Thank you, Tim, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm Ryan Wagespack, Senior Vice President with the National Air Transportation Association. I spent uh, almost two decades in the industry working with aircraft owners, charter customers, and 135 uh, entities around the country. And I saw firsthand the challenges, but also the opportunities in the market. Uh, so in, in November of uh, 2018, I joined NATA as an executive to continue to make progress and, and invoke some real change in the industry. Because at the close of the day, it's, it's all about keeping our, our flying public safe and keeping our size safe. So thank you for having me on. Kent? Thanks, Ryan. I, have, I share Ryan's views. I've been in this industry for a long time. I started flying in 1980, and I've been writing books and uh, helping clients with these issues since 1993. And the problem of the illegal charter has always been there. Sometimes it's because people don't understand and sometimes it's because people don't care. Um, as an industry, we're working on both of those issues. Thanks. Don, okay. would you like to introduce yourself? You bet. Thanks, Tim. All right, thanks guys. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And once again, my name is Don Riley and I'm an aviation safety inspector for the FAA's special emphasis investigations team. Obviously that's hard to say, so we just go by our acronym, SEAT. 
Um, we're in flight standards under, under general aviation safety assurance. Just a little bit about me. Um, I came into the FAA back in 2001, and before that worked with a couple of small airlines in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And before that, I was in the Air Force and flew as a radar navigator on a B-52. I've worked with SEAT uh, going on 16 years now, and I've seen more than my share of illegal charters over that time. And despite our best efforts, they continue to morph and change into where they are today. Um, I want to thank Ryan and Kent for their views uh, on how we got there. From my perspective as a safety inspector, it's all about, you know, one thing, safety, right? Safety of the flying public. Uh, for you folks in the back of the airplane, it's your safety. Um, it's not a pleasant thought, but sometimes ca uh, catastrophic consequences do occur on these types of operations. And I think as an agency, we realize that enforcement alone wasn't going to make a big enough dent in the problem. And in order to make a lasting difference, we really needed to think outside the box to reach a much wider audience and engage all the stakeholders through public meetings like this, uh, working in cooperation with our industry partners, helping to educate their members and legitimate operators on what to look for and how to avoid and report when they see these kinds of operations. And by helping and educating pilots, we also took on educating our inspector workforce and, and on how to identify and handle these kinds of operations. And finally, to the number one stakeholder in all of this, you in the back of the airplane, we needed to reach out to you, which brings us to today and your safety. So from my view, that's kind of how we got here. And now I'd like to introduce Dave Volker. Hi, everybody. Uh, again, my name is David Volker. Thanks, Don. I started out in aviation back in the 70s, uh, decided to make uh, a career out of it back in the, in the 80s. I became a pilot examiner and I ran a flight school and flew corporate and charter and air ambulance. Then in the late 90s, 96, I joined the FAA. I was a principal operations inspector for about 20 years involving, involved with uh, 135 oversight responsibilities. And then 2017, in January 2017, joined the CIA Special Emphasis Investigations Team. And hopefully we can all work together and make a change in the illegal charter business. Back to you, Tim. Thank you, everyone. Let's bring in FAA Senior Attorney Greg Lander to briefly introduce himself and help us understand the basic regulatory requirements, the nuts and bolts of charter operations. Good afternoon, Greg. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Tim. My name is Greg Lander. I am an attorney with the FAA's Enforcement Division, and I echo Larry's earlier comments. Today, I wanna to focus on you, the traveling public. I want to help you to recognize your potential liability using legal and illegal operators and to choose wisely. Looking at slide nine, as we defined in the regulations, operate means to use or cause to use. Operational control with respect to a flight means the exercise of authority over initiating, conducting, or terminating a flight. The key words in this definition are exercise of authority. Those words and the entire definition mean that the person having operational control is responsible for the operation of the aircraft. If we look at slide 10, Operational control involves three basic areas, air crew, aircraft, and flight management. Advisory Circular 91-37B provides a detailed explanation of operational control, as well as evidentiary facts to determine who has it. Those factors include who provided the plane, who provided the pilot, along with the other factors listed on the slide. Determinations of operational control are fact specific and made on a flight by flight basis. Please turn to slide 11. 
with regard to aircraft leases and the federal aviation regulations, there are two main types of aircraft leases, wet and dry. And I assure you that they have nothing to do with water, but they have everything to do with operational control and liability. In a wet lease, the aircraft and at least one crew member are provided together as a package. In a wet lease, the lessor, the person providing both the plane and pilot, retains operational control. A dry lease of an aircraft is one in which the lessor provides only the aircraft and the lessee, the person leasing the aircraft, supplies his or her own flight crew and exercises operational control of the flight. Think of a wet lease in terms of taking a ride share or a taxi. The ride share or cab company provides the car and the driver. You're just along for the ride. The ride share or cab company is exercising operational control. If there are any issues, the ride share or cab operator is responsible. Similarly, when you use a certificated air carrier or air operator, you can be sure that you are not exercising operational control of that flight and are not liable for it. All you are doing is saying, I want to leave at this time on this date and I wanna go from A to B, just like your cab or ride share. On the other hand, think of a dry lease like renting a car. The car rental company the lessor, simply provides you the car, not a driver. You are responsible as the lessee for the operation of that car. Call it operational control. You're responsible to return it, maintain it, and liable for any damages, injury, etc. It's all there in that tiny, tiny print on the back of the rental agreement. As the lessee of that car, you are liable. Likewise, when you dry lease an aircraft, you are liable for personal injury, death or property damage or loss. When you sign a dry lease stating that you are responsible and will exercise operational control, whether or not you understand it or realize it, you are assuming all liability. Now think about that. Are you insured for that? Can you financially accept that liability? Do you know the risks you are accepting? That alone should cause concern, but it's not all. You have even more to worry about, whether you know it or not, when you sign that lease. Some person or company may have you sign what's titled a dry lease, but it's a sham. That company or person will be providing both the pilot and the airplane, just like the rideshare or cab company example, a wet lease. Please know this. Certificated air carriers and air operators are required by statute and regulation to have insurance to provide special flight training and testing and qualification for their pilots, adhere to strict maintenance standards, crew duty and rest requirements, mandatory drug and alcohol testing, and formal oversight by the FAA. All of these regulatory safeguards for you as the lessee do not exist. This is how these sham dry lease operators can charge less than certificated operators. Besides being illegal, is saving a few bucks worth it? Is your life and your life's work 
and perhaps your fam's, family's lives worth it? Leasing aircraft can be done safely and legally and can avoid these liabilities. But to ensure that it is done properly, you must contact not just any attorney, but one who understands aviation and aviation issues, like our next speaker, Mr. Kent Jackson. Kent? Thanks, Greg. Next slide, please. All right. Most of you in aviation are familiar with Part 91 and Part 135, but I know we have some people uh, who are learning these terms for the first time. Part 91 is the baseline general operating rules. It, just, it defines how you fly. For people learning to fly, uh, flight instructors like to say that Part 61 is how you earn your certificate, and Part 91 is how you can lose your certificate. Part 91 is the baseline for operations. Part 135 stacks on top of Part 91. It's additional requirements if you want to operate as a commercial operator. So literally, one, Part 135 is added to all of Part 91. So if you want to fly on demand, if you want to fly charter, you need to have either an air carrier certificate or an operating certificate issued by the FAA. When are you required to hold one of these? Generally speaking, if you're going to carry persons or property for hire. Now there are exceptions in part 91 and that's why I say generally speaking, but if you don't have a very specific exception that you're going to operate under, these general rules apply. Operator, as Greg was explaining, is the person or company with operational control. Pilots have operational control. There is always a pilot in command, but there's usually a company as well. And that's why the, the FAA uses the word person. Ironically, the word person includes companies. But it's also important to understand when we talk about companies, the FAA is not like the IRS. They don't have any concept of disregarded entities. So when we talk about persons or property, that's who's on board. But when we talk about person with operational control, that may mean an individual pilot as well as a company that that pilot is working for. When we talk about compensation or hire, it's important to understand compensation is construed broadly by the courts. It doesn't just mean being paid, it can mean other kinds of reimbursement. So understand that the courts construe that quite broadly in this context. Next slide, please. There are fundamental operational differences. Both are safe, especially when done right, but the regulatory oversight and operational requirements are much higher for Part 135. Part 91 requires an airworthy airplane, a qualified crew, and that you're complying with the rules of the road. But as I said before, Part 135 stacks on top of the requirements of Part 91. So Part 135, you first have to get an air carrier certificate. That's not easy. I've done it. I've been writing books about this subject for years. It still took me over a year to get my air carrier certificate when I decided to do that. You have additional maintenance requirements. You have crew training requirements that are higher than what's required for Part 91 all while working with the FAA. There are philosophical differences. Part 91, if you're flying it for yourself, for your company, paying for it yourself, or your company's paying for it, and you're responsible, Part 91 is generally going to work. 
and Greg spoke quite eloquently about how the FAA views that operational liability. A simple way to think about it is Part 91 is more flexible than Part 135, and it was designed that way. But the price of Part 91 flexibility is responsibility. And if someone is approaching you with something that's not charter, but somehow doesn't give you any responsibility while operating under Part 91, you should be suspicious. We're going to talk more about holding out later, but if someone is holding out airplane and crew under Part 91, unless there's a very specific exception, it should be done under Part 135. If you're a mere passenger paying for a flight, you should expect the additional oversight that comes with Part 135. Thank you, and back to you, Tim. Thanks, Kent. Don Riley will tell us about types of illegal charters and holding out. Okay, thanks, Tim. All right, so what does an illegal charter look like? Um, it's a really good question, especially for you guys riding in the back of the aircraft, some of the forms that these things take. And by far the most common scheme we see from our side at the FAA is what's known as a sham dry lease. It's kind of been spoken to already, but I wanna tell you how it works. You get approached by someone or you hear about an operator down the road that flies people out to Vegas or on business trips at a cheap price, they have a great jet and they're really easy to work with. Sounds like a good deal. You'll pay them and just like a charter operator, they take care of everything. But when you actually look into it, you find that they want you to sign a dry lease for their jet, still at the great price. Now, with a true dry lease, you would take possession of the aircraft and you would operate it as your own, kind of like Greg Lander explained. You would go out, hire and pay the pilots. You would be in charge of getting the fuel set up, in charge of scheduling the aircraft for the flight, maintenance, etc. But remember, it's yours to use by this dry lease, much like leasing a car. That's why you would have to do all these things in a true dry lease. You would have control. You would have operational control. And oh, by the way, again, you have the liability too. But that's probably not what you wanted, right? You wanted someone else to take care of everything, take care of all those headaches and the liability so you can just ride. So the sham now comes into play because it's actually the lessor, the person you signed the lease with that maintains control, operational control of the aircraft. From the pilots, to the scheduling, to the fuel, to the maintenance, et cetera, they handle everything just like a charter company would. And of course they charge you for it. But here's the rub that I want you to remember. With this sham dry lease, this operator that's in control of the flight has none of the required safety measures and controls that a legitimate authorized operator has for your safety. They have become an illegal operator without certification and authorization from us. And therefore you are literally accepting a higher level of risk and you're accepting the liability. Higher risk, higher liability. It really doesn't sound like a good deal to me. And I want everyone to remember this, even if it's the only thing you take away from today. A legitimate FAA certificated authorized operator will never ask you to sign a dry lease. Um, Advisory Circular 9137B has been mentioned. It is a great document. Again, it's 9137B. It's titled Truth in Leasing, and it's written directly to shed light on this scenario. It will help you avoid this scheme. It's a great guide, I promise. Okay, management companies. Management companies have been around forever and are completely legitimate. Aircraft owners don't want the headache of having their own flight department, so they will hire a management company to do it for them. The only problem comes in if they start operating illegal charters on the side, again, possibly through these dry leases. And again, they maintain operational control and they get compensated for it. 
Okay, certificate holders, actual certificated uh, air carriers that will sometimes operate aircraft that are not, that they aren't authorized to. For example, a carrier may be authorized citation jets, but actually fly customers around in Falcons or Hawkers. Since they are not authorized these aircraft, they will not have the required maintenance, pilot training, et cetera, in place for your safety. And as you can imagine, we here at the FAA don't take kindly to this when we run across these kinds of operators. Okay, demo flights or demonstration flights. These are sometimes used as a disguise for air transportation. A demo flight is perfectly legal if the aircraft is for sale and you are interested in purchasing the aircraft. But if the flight is actually for your transportation, okay, i.e. from point A to point B for a business meeting, vacation, et cetera, and there's no intention of selling or purchasing the aircraft, that's going to be a problem if, it, if it's flown as a demo flight or quoted to you as a demo flight. So be careful. If you see a demo flight or anything like that on the paperwork and your need is only air transportation, be careful. Okay, fake flight instruction. This is an interesting one and we've seen it a few times. You may see an advertisement or hear from an operator, hey, come out and fly with us and take a flying lesson and we'll take you wherever you need to go. When you show up with your bags packed for Lake Tahoe, you really don't get any flight instruction, but you may be given an iPad and some headphones and you read something vaguely related to flying. And after your weekend is done, the same thing coming home. It's clearly not in flight, it's clearly not flight instruction. Okay, misuse of expense sharing. So pilots and passengers can share expenses to a destination under some defined circumstances. In a relatively new document, there's another FAA advisory circular 61-142, 61-142, and it's called Sharing Aircraft Operating Expenses. And this is a wonderful resource for you to reference both as a passenger and a pilot. It gives very good real life scenarios to help you determine if you can legally share expenses. The biggest thing to remember with sharing expenses is a term called the common purpose test. A pilot needs to have a common purpose with his or her passengers and to have his or, his or her own reason for traveling to the destination in order to legally share expenses. Next slide, please. Okay, holding out. It's kind of a funny term and basically at its core, it means advertising. Okay, and this holding out can take many different forms, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But first, why, why is that important? Well, it's one of the four elements that make an operator a common carrier, someone willing to fly the public around. And why that's important is if they are deemed a common carrier, an operator, they need to be authorized by the FAA. And that means for you in the back of the airplane, a required higher level of safety. So the four elements of a, of a common carriage, you can see our common carrier on, this, on the slide there are holding out of a willingness to transport persons or property from place to place for compensation. Next slide, please. And here's some of the ways holding out can occur. Um, it can occur through agents, meaning people that act on behalf of an operator to go out and get customers by reputation or word of mouth. Say you're standing on the 18th green and your golfing partner says, hey, if you ever need to have a jet to go anywhere, Fred down the road there will take care of you for a great price. Give him a shout. Okay, that's word of mouth holding out. And reputation is similar and just like it sounds, Fred has a reputation to fly folks around and everyone in the area knows about it. I wanna tell you that we find that especially in the sham dry lease scenarios, most people get involved via one of these two ways, word of mouth and reputation. But there's still the old fashioned ways, right? Uh, advertising in magazines, newspapers, uh, perhaps a bulletin board on the airport terminal, 
or um, in the FBO. And obviously these days it can happen uh, via the internet and social media, which is everywhere. Before we move on, I just wanna to reiterate to you, if you or your friends or your business partners have gotten involved with an operator in any of these ways, please, as Larry said earlier, make sure they are authorized by asking the simple question, can I see your FAA certificate? Tim, back to you. Thanks, Don. Ryan, would you please talk about the three types of charter operators? Absolutely, Kim. Thank you. So when NATA uh, created the Legal Charter Task Force, we knew that the focus was going to really need to be heavy on education. And so we said, well, who's the market? And how do we continue to, to work and get out there? And we deemed there was three areas, the careless, clueless, and the criminal. So we deemed as the careless is kind of a, the, the individuals with a misunderstanding of the regulations, but should know better. Uh, the clueless, of course, have no idea of any of the regulations and how involved the FAA is in, in, in our regulatory space as it relates to flying in our skies. And of course, the criminal is, are those with the clear intent of skirting the regulations. So, you know, with NATA and FAA working together, this has really been, and other agencies and associations, it's really been a great opportunity uh, to showcase industry and the regulators working together and moving the needle as it relates to safety. We've, we've gone out, we've done uh, a tremendous amount of outreach in regions um, around the country, uh, pre-COVID of course, now it's all gone on virtual, uh, but uh, going out, meeting with stakeholders, local FISDOs, um, aircraft um, uh, management, brokers, and it's had tremendous ripple effects in the market. Uh, NATA has created a website, uh, a location, a landing page where the market can go and source, um, you know, to check to see if an aircraft is on a tail number, uh, or excuse me, if a tail number is on a uh, 135 operation. Um, and of course, a, a litany of other resources uh, to educate and get, the, get out there for the aircraft uh, market in place. Um, Future efforts of education are really going to be focused heavy on uh, pilot engagement um, as we move forward in 2021. Don? Okay, thanks, Ryan. Can we have slide 18, please? Okay, so what are we doing about this? Ryan mentioned a few things there um, from FAA. We're going to continue to do these education webinars uh, for aircraft owners, operators, and passengers, and other stakeholders. There are plans in motion to reach out to aviation universities, flight schools, and also plans for a pilot-specific webinar coming up. We continue to work and collaborate with our industry partners in these education efforts, and we are also seeking their input to help identify non-compliant operators. We plan to, as, as Ryan mentioned about COVID, once that lets up, we plan to get out and meet in person at events across the country to keep this ball rolling. We're gonna to continue to develop new and additional education tools for our inspector workforce. So as they are out in the field making in-person contacts, they can be confident in identifying these kinds of operators and also educating them on how to handle those once they identify. I wanna reiterate what Ryan said, that we do run across people operating illegal charters that um, you know, are clueless or careless. And if they're willing to work with us in the FAA compliance program, we can often work out a path for them to come into compliance without going to enforcement. We're also encouraging folks to get certified. Again, as long as you're willing, cooperative, and most importantly, you agree to stop operating outside the rules. But for those who will not or cannot comply, we still have the enforcement route to go. And here to discuss what FAA enforcement can look like, I'll turn it back over to my esteemed colleague, Mr. Greg Lander. Thanks, Don. Um, with regard to enforcement actions, um, we always, we at the FAA always begin with the compliance program. If you are fit, willing, and able to be compliant, we'll end there. 
if compliance action is not appropriate, but whatever occurred doesn't rise to the level of legal enforcement action, we may handle it with what we refer to as administrative action. And in those cases, normally it's a warning letter. If neither of these is appropriate, the next step is legal enforcement action. Operating illegal charters is very serious. Legal enforcement action may involve certificate actions, including revocation or suspension of certificates and or civil penalty actions. There is no set sanction. The facts and circumstances of each case determines that sanction. No pilot wants to have his or her certificate suspended or revoked. Likewise, no company wants to receive a letter from the FAA stating that the company has violated some regulation they've never heard of, and the FAA is willing to accept $3.6 million to settle the matter. Despite these potential sanctions, illegal charters persist nonetheless. With regard to criminal actions, the FAA will refer such cases to the appropriate entity for prosecution. For example, we revoked the pilot certificate of an individual who repeatedly flew illegal charter flights carrying illegal aliens into and out of the United States. But the FAA did not put him in jail. Federal law enforcement did that. Likewise, an illegal charter operator that had his pilot certificate revoked for flying illegal charters, uh, we, we revoked his certificate, but in the meantime, he was billing FEMA and other government agencies for flights allegedly conducted in uh, support of hurricane relief. And of course, he was pursued by numerous law enforcement entities regarding that criminal activity. If anyone has any specific questions, happy to address them. At this time, I'd like to hand off the discussion to Dave Volker, who will tell you about the resources available to you to determine if the flight you are contemplating is a legitimate charter flight or not. Dave? Thanks, Greg. Uh, the following uh, resources and red flags we're going to talk about are a recap of what was just discussed and heard by the speakers. Uh, the first uh, is the AC 120-12. That, that particular AC, it, although it's, it's fairly old, it's still incredibly valid. It defines the four pillars of common carriage that Don mentioned earlier. This is an older AC, like I said, but it is valid. The AC defines what it means for holding out a willingness to transport persons or property for compensation or hire. And as I said, when all four of these pillars are present, an air carrier certificate, Part 135, is required. And both Greg and Don spoke of AC 9137, the Truth in Leasing AC. This is a really great AC. It was written to help the lessee and that's the guy who, who signed the agreement to help the lessor, the lessee understand what a lease really does. Via the lease, operational control, you can also read that as legal responsibility becomes the lessee's responsibility. The AC lists seven questions of legal responsibility and who has it. Very often, lease agreements are signed without the lessee reading or understanding that the lease agreement transferred legal responsibility and liability to that lessee. The motive for signing the lease? To purchase transportation by air. AC 61142, um, I think uh, Greg just mentioned that and Don too. Um, that's a really recent and new uh, AC. Uh, it, it, it defines and explains how a pilot can determine whether or not he is properly sharing expenses when it's legal, applicable, appropriate, and when it's not. Uh, order FAA Order 8900.1 uh, also gets into 
in the volume 313, it involves lease and interchange agreements and operational control uh, for carriers on in volume three, chapter 25. Next slide, please. Sorry, I gotta catch up. Uh, additional resources uh, for understanding and reporting suspected illegal charters. Uh, they are for the public, i.e. the charter, to determine for themselves the legitimacy of the operator they've hired or considering hiring. Frequently, an operator may look and sound legitimate, in fact, does not hold an air carrier certificate. I have personally investigated illegal charter operations where the travel department for the passenger did not know how to determine the legitimacy of the operator and of course did not know what questions to ask. Uh, the first listing there is avoidillegalcharter.com, NATA, that has a lookup by operator name and end number. You can look that up to see if the aircraft that is being going to be used for the charter is a, a legitimate 135 air carrier certificate. There is also an online reporting portal on this website, as well as a phone number for reporting concerns about suspected illegal charter. The phone number is provided by the Air Charter Safety Foundation to report concerns. If your call goes to voicemail, please do leave a detailed message with your contact information. You will, your call will be returned. And I recently tested it and I did get a call back. Under the Safe Air Charter uh, website, lists common red flags to help you recognize illegal charter, as well as ways to report illegal charter. There are links to FAA guidance to educate you about regulatory requirements. Additionally, there's an operator's search for legitimate Part 135 operators and a search by end number and more. BAA.org allows you to search the topic of illegal charter and a vast of other information. This is also a link to the NBAA, an aviation organization supporting legitimate, legally certificated Part 135 operators. FAA.gov, Go Part 135, this FAA website lists the five phases of, of certification process for Part 135, as well as the link to safety assurance. This is a reinforcement to those of us on the outside under, trying to understand why 135 is the way to go. It is a safer, more as more layers of safety than a straight part 91. NTSB.gov allows you to search for illegal charter ops, uh, topics as well as access to an aviation database. Next slide, please. The most common attempt to transfer operational control as Don mentioned is via lease agreement. A red flag here is when the lessee does not truly have operational control, nor does the lessee know what operational control is or the legal responsibility that it that at least confers. A legitimate charter operator certified with the FAA will not ask you to sign a dry lease and that makes that would make you responsible for the flight and associated liability. A significant cost saving is not paying the federal excise tax. This means that the quote can be less than the legitimate air carrier may quote. If federal excise tax is not being charged, suspect that it may be an illegal 135 operator. However, at the moment, as a part of the coronavirus aid relief and the Economic Security Act, the, uh, the, presented the federal excise tax that applies to commercial, uh, commercial operations including charter flights conducted under Part 135 of the Federal Aviation Regulations has been suspended effective March of 2020 through January, the beginning of January, 2021. Some other red flags, a failure of the flight crew to give a safety briefing to the passengers, a lack of briefing cards. Those are violations of Part 135 Federal Aviation Regulations. When you ask a question that, it, that you have a concern about, a legitimate air carrier will not circumvent that question. They will not circumvent safety and they will not avoid answering your concerns. 
Once more, uh, passengers are sometimes taught how to respond to questions if asked by an FAA inspector conducting a ramp inspection. This should be a huge red flag, suggesting that this is an illegal charter. Typical coaching of the passengers might be, oh, this flight was paid for by the owner and the passengers are not paying anything for the flight. Or the passenger is an owner via a membership in an LLC or they are lessees and they fully understand operational control and their legal responsibility. Next slide, please. So to recap this part of it, we need help from the public to put an end to illegal charters, the illegal 135 operations. Not only do illegal charters lack the safety attributes of training and checking and flight duty limitations, drug and alcohol testing of a legitimate 135 operator that has in place, they, they put the public at great risk. But the illegal charter poses an economic threat to legitimate operators by undercutting their prices as well. Public awareness and involvement would go far to reduce this threat. Back to you, Tim. Tim, unmute. Okay, folks, we've got, that concludes our panel discussion. We have lots of questions coming into our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube platforms. We have this question from Lewis. What are the costs associated with the air charter operation? Who'd like to take that? Tim, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, well, the, the costs are, um, a lot of costs you may not see. Obviously, um, overhead costs for a charter operator, they're gonna be the maintenance of the aircraft, uh, their pilot training, um, safety requirements that they have to comply with, maintenance requirements that they have to comply with. So that's kind of all built into the, to the charter price. Uh, but I think the point is here, if you get a really good cheap price, and it, you're thinking it's probably too good to be true, nothing like the other quotes you got, it probably is too good to be true. So be careful, that, that could be a red flag on a really low price. Okay, uh, another question. What should I ask the air charter broker to determine if the flight is legal? Don, you wanna take that? Um, sure. Well, much like an operator, if you're booking a charter through a broker, you need to ask that broker, is this a certified operator, certified air carrier? And from the broker, get the air carrier certificate. The operator that they're working with will be glad to give the broker the certificate. And it's really the same thing. So ask the broker for the air carrier certificate. And Don, I think we've got a follow-on question that might dovetail into that. Beth asked, what does an operating certificate look like? Okay, great, yeah. Because it's been talked about this whole, this whole day, right? Uh, Larry mentioned it right off the bat. And for the folks out there, th this is what an air carrier certificate is gonna look like. Actually, it says air carrier certificate right on it. Uh, it'll have the name of the operator, as you can see there, and it will also be signed by someone in the FAA. So that should be hanging up on the wall in their office or they should give you a copy of it when asked. If they don't, if they're um, evasive about that or, or can't produce it, uh, it's a red flag and you probably need to go find another air carrier. Uh, next, next image, I think we have another one. Okay, so it's been mentioned, um, some of the websites you can go and find the end numbers or the tail numbers of the aircraft that operators are actually authorized to fly. And, and that is true on the websites. But this document, and it, it's probably a little blurry for you folks out there, but it's called a D85. And that's all you have to remember is a D85. And it will blow your operator's mind if you ask for this piece of paper, but it lists all the aircraft by the end number, tail number, whatever you want to call it, that they can actually fly. And they should be able to give you this too, if you, if you want to uh, want to look at it. 
but the same information is also available on the NATA website and the FA website. It, it'll be a little bit different form. It doesn't look like a document. It'll just be a list of uh, tail numbers, end numbers that each operator can legally operate. Okay. Uh, we also received a question from Ed who asked, does the FAA have to show holding out to prove a charter is illegal? Kent, you want to take that one? Sure. And, and the answer is no. The FAA doesn't have to prove holding out because the general rule, which is hidden in part 119, it's actually 119.23 subsection B, says that private carriage in an aircraft with 20 seats or less or less than 6,000 pounds of payload is governed by part 135. So if you don't have a specific exception, such as 91501 or 91.321, then the general rule of 119 applies and that needs to be conducted under part 135. Thanks, Tim. Okay, Kent, we have another question from Joseph that says, can you please discuss the legalities of ramp checking passengers? Who'd like to take that? Greg? Sure. Uh, the legality is the FAA may conduct uh, investigation, inspections, what have you, anywhere, anytime, obviously uh, within certain confines, uh, property rights, time of day, that sort of thing. But to ramp inspect an aircraft, uh, the FAA just off the top of my head, uh, 6151 I1I says that um, upon reasonable request, pilot must provide to the administrator, that would be the inspector, uh, pilot certificate, logs, medical, what have you, um, and, and that's part and parcel of a ramp inspection. Um, speaking to the passengers, that sort of thing, um, that's, that's well within an inspector's purview to do. Uh, can't force anyone to talk to us, but it's obviously within our purview to do. And then of course, the inspection of the airplane itself um, is well within the FAA's uh, statutory and regulatory rights to do. I hope that answered the question. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, Craig asked, why is it the public's responsibility to know whether a charter is legitimate? Dave, would you like to address that? Sure, sure, Tim. Um, Ken Jackson mentioned a little while ago that it took a long time and a lot of work to become certificated as a 135 air carrier, the, the public needs to understand that that process that Kent went through was for the safety attributes to all be in place at the time he was certificated as an air carrier. Some of the things that are not there in a non-certificated entity have already been mentioned, but just to repeat them, uh, one, the flight and duty times where Pilots are limited to the amount of time that they can actually be flying and working. Uh, drug and alcohol programs, drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, there's no program for 91 operators to do that. Um, insurance, um, concrete uh, operational control procedures, just to name a few. But again, I, to, to, to sum it up, a passenger or a someone looking for a charter really needs to understand that that FAA oversight is in place for that carrier, thus at least increasing their safety concerns. Tim? Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Mike. Are more people chartering aircraft due to the COVID crisis? Ryan, would you like to take that? Yeah, absolutely, Tim. So we are seeing a, a surge in the private aviation sector. You know, for, for years, the sector has always been seen as a, as a luxury, a leisure method of travel, but now it's being seen more as an essential method. Um, you know, we're, we're expecting the numbers to continue to go up into 2021 as business travel has not yet returned. We're still sitting at like a 90-10 split, 10, 10, uh, 90 
personal and of course 10 business. So we expect that number to go up. Uh, you know, I've, I've been on the road for the last uh, nine weeks, traveling the country, visiting airports around uh, the uh, lower 48. And it's been incredible to see the use in the general aviation and private sector at uh, 9139 fields. It's, it's the activity has, has exploded. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, I have another question here from a pilot. Randy wanting to know, I'm a part 91 contract pilot. Can I still charge my passengers? Greg, you want to address that? Uh, sure, Tim. And, and thank you, Randy, for the question. Uh, the short answer, the short attorney answer is it depends. And without all the facts, uh, obviously the answers may vary. There are a lot of exceptions and issues to consider. So my answer will be somewhat generic, but let me expound on that. As Kent Jackson described earlier, there are two basic issues to address. Part 61 certificate qualifications and then the appropriate operating rule. Part 91, 119, 135, etc. If you are, as you state, charging passengers for your services under Part 61, you must, with very limited exception, possess a valid ATP or commercial pilot certificate and a valid medical certificate appropriate to the operations, likely at least a second class. Next, we must address the applicable operating rule. If you are a pilot for ABC XYZ company, and that company owns an aircraft and you are employed by that company, you're likely okay. If you are approached by an aircraft owner, and that owner hires you to fly him or her in the owner's aircraft, that is likely okay as well. On the other hand, if you are doing any of the following, I would suggest contacting the local flight standards district office for a consultation before taking another flight. That would be this, renting an airplane yourself and then flying passengers or property for hire. Acting as a flight instructor but not flight instructing, but simply transporting passengers from place to place. Um, another one, advertising flights on the internet where you provide the aircraft and your pilot services. Or as we've been discussing earlier today, working in concert with an aircraft owner to fly passengers not associated with the aircraft or company for hire under the guise of a dry lease. There are other examples. Um, as, as advice, look at 14 CFR section 119.1, E is an echo, and see if what you are doing is listed. Aerial advertising, flight instruction, sales demonstration, et cetera. If not, I would strongly urge you to contact your local FISDO before continuing. Safety first, they will assist you, not to mention help you avoid any potential regulatory violations. I hope that answered your question, Randy. Back to you, Tim. Okay, we've got another one here. Um, can you discuss the impact of a single member and single purpose LLC of an illegal charter? I think maybe they're talking about the flight department trap. Would you and Kent like to address that? Uh, Kent, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Sure. This issue has been around for a long time. It, the reg is... 14 CFR 91.501 B5, but you really need to read into the, the history of it to understand what it's saying. What it's saying is if you have a company whose only purpose is to provide air transportation, even if it's only purpose to provide air transportation to another company that's affiliated, 
That requires a Part 135 certificate. Part 91 in the business world was designed for operating incidental to within the scope of your main business. There are a lot of exceptions. This is a complex area, but it's not complicated uh, to understand that an entity such as an LLC whose only business is to sell air transportation needs to have a 135 certificate. I would add that, uh, yeah, thank you, Kent. And uh, you can come to work for the FAA <laughs> whenever you want. Uh, part one, if somebody wants to look, 14 CFR part one, definitions. Look under the definition of commercial operator. And it's pretty straightforward. The definition of a commercial operator and what it says. And the definition includes the statement that uh, we look at whether the operation uh, transporting passengers is and of itself a major enterprise. And we within the FAA and industry as well refer to that as the major enterprise test. And if the only purpose of this LLC, this company, this entity, whatever it might be, is transportation of passengers or property for compensation or hire, you must have a 119 certificate issued to you. Um, it, it, it shows up all the time. It, uh, as, as Ken mentioned earlier, 91501, it, it even pops up in uh, uh, people operating uh, smaller aircraft, um, the dreaded flight department company. Well, actually the company has no purpose other than providing flights. So that is its major enterprise. And if that's all it does, it must have a certificate under 119. Um, Ryan, do you run into this uh, or get requests uh, for interpretations or, or whatever feedback from uh, operators on this issue? Uh, from time to time, yeah. You know, the literature, the rules, very clear, very clear. And um, it, it, it just has to be avoided. If that is the, this isn't a hit against the industry aviation attorneys because they know more. This is more a hit against those who aren't industry aviation attorneys. And when someone comes to them and says, I'm buying a new airplane, but I sure don't want sued if something happens to that airplane. We as attorneys all learned in first year of law school, oh, well, put it in its own company. And then all they get is the assets of the company and you're okay. And what do people do? They follow that legal advice and they put that aircraft in a single entity uh, company of some sort. And that right there starts you down the path of a flight department company. So please don't just ask any attorney for this kind of advice. Go to someone like Kent or someone who is well-versed and experienced in aviation matters. Uh, they will give you the right advice. That's really what you need. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Greg. It looks like we've got one that says, how do we contact the FAA Safe Air Charter Group if we have more questions? Well, you'd go to www.faa.gov forward slash go forward slash Safe Air Charter and click on the contact Safe Air Charter to send us an email. We have a scenario to discuss next. Say an aircraft owner dry leases his aircraft out to two separate people or entities. He's making good money and wants to add three or four more leases. Does the FAA see that as a problem? Greg, I expect you're ready for that one. Hey, Greg, um, I, can, I can answer it for you. It depends. <laughs> Man, you stole my thunder. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the question, whoever that was. Um, as I stated in the previous question, uh, the short attorney answer is, as Don said, it depends. And, and without all the facts, the, the answer could vary widely. 
there are a lot of exceptions and issues to consider, including dry lease, wet lease, holding out, operational control, et cetera. So let me again try to answer generally. And the answer may be a little surprising. Um, the FAA may, see, may not see this as a problem at all. On the other hand, it may see it as a problem and you only have one lease. The issue is not and never is the number of leases or how they're titled, dry lease, wet lease, whatever. It is how each flight is operated. Each flight. Again, who has operational control? If the lessor is providing both the aircraft and the pilot, or the pilot is working in concert with the aircraft operator. You may be conducting operations requiring a 119 certificate. Uh, you may be holding out to the public and you may be doing all of this without any intent to do so, but nevertheless, that is what's happening. Um, on the other hand, it may be a very legitimate operation. But again, it's a fact intensive by flight by flight consideration. I would suggest that before you add these new lessees, uh, you contact your local FISDO and ask for their assessment. If you wish, you may submit these leases to an FAA um, office FISDO and they can forward them to an FAA attorney to review. If it appears that a 119 certificate is required, the FAA FISDO will work with you to obtain that certificate. It's a win-win situation. And um, I, I wish you the best with it. Um, I would throw it to uh, Kent and um, with the suggestion that perhaps you seek out someone like Kent and ask them for their opinion on it. Kent, if somebody came to you with this question, how would you start the conversation? Start with the conversation with where the pilot's coming from. If you have one airplane and more than one user, but each user has their own pilot, W-2, absolute employee of that company, you're never gonna have an issue with the FAA the gray area is somewhere in between <laughs> what Greg <laughs> talked about. And, and he keeps talking about the short attorney answer. And I don't want to point out I'm five foot nine. <laughs> I don't keep doing that. Um, back to you, Tim. Okay. Thanks, Kent. A few people are asking how to get a copy of this presentation. Well, this webinar will be archived on YouTube. And with that, we'd like to thank the audience and the panelists for joining, watching, and participating. More information can be found at faa.gov forward slash go forward slash safe air charter. And if there's still questions, you can post them in the comment section and we'll get back and answer them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the FAA Safe Air Charter Workshop. Thank you and have a safe and wonderful day.